Welcome to episode 76 of Talking Dairy. I'm today's host, Jack McGowan. In today's podcast, we're going to be talking about animal care practices on dairy farms in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Animals are at the heart of every dairy farming business, and we know New Zealand farmers take a lot of pride in caring for their stock. As well as these intrinsic motivators to look after cows and calves, the New Zealand dairy sector relies on its reputation as a producer of sustainable and ethical dairy products to sell our milk to the world. To support the sector to achieve high levels of animal welfare, Dairy NZ has been interviewing farmers about their animal care practices as part of the annual Animal Care Consults project for over a decade now. The information from the consult is used to track changes in practice, inform extension activities and future research, and inform submissions to government when advocating for practical, outcome-based rules. We'll be talking with Penny Timmer Ahrens, Dairy NZ's lead advisor for animal care, and Hannah Fulton, a dairy farmer in Canterbury who has close involvement with the animal care consults. Tēnā korua, welcome to the podcast, Hannah and Penny. Penny, can you share a bit about your background and how you came to work at Dairy NZ? Yep, sure. Um, so I'm the lead advisor for animal care at Dairy NZ and have been for just over a year, but I've been working in the animal welfare field 13 years, if I add it all up. I came from MPI, but I always have been working in the education space, so um, taking the kind of standards and requirements for looking after animals um, and talking to farmers and stock agents and things. So coming over to Dairy NZ, it hasn't been a huge change. It's just that now I only have to talk about cows and calves, um, which is good because they're my favourite. And I understand you've spent some time with cows and calves in your personal life? Yep. Um, so I also did a stint um, dairy farming down in Southland, up in the Waikato now, because so I didn't quite, couldn't quite hack the cold. Um, but yeah, spent five years, sort of started off as kind of the weekend release milker and ended up sheer milking for a couple of years on a 500 cow farm just out of the Macargo. We had our own runoff. So did all our own winter grazing. So I've done a lot around the winter grazing space and animal welfare as well. But now up in the sunny Waikato. Brilliant. We're lucky to have you, Penny. And Hannah, tell us about yourself. Um, where do you farm and, and what do you love about it? Craig and I farm in just south of Ashburton. Peak milk, 6.30 cows. Just love everything about it, really. Obviously, like Penny, animals is my passion, hence what we do. Penny, tell us about the Animal Care Consult Project and what it aims to do for the sector. So it's been running for over a decade um, and I've only been at Dairy NZ for a year. So just sort of acknowledge that I'm building on the work of previous employees, farmers um, and Hannah and the survey team as well. And what we do is we go out and we ask sort of roughly 250 farmers a year about their animal care practices um, and that covers a wide ground from, you know, how they look after their transition cows in spring through to calf care and a little bit around kind of mastitis and those kind of animal health challenges as well. So it's quite broad and that lets us sort of pick up opportunities for maybe more extension on something or we actually we can see where the sector's adapted really well to a particular change or new research where they've adopted a new tool. So it's really cool to kind of see how the sector's improving and form our kind of own internal extension and education. Um, and we can also use that information for submissions to the government on policy as well. So Hannah, you've been involved in these consults almost since they started. Tell us, how did you get involved and what do you do in the project? I was involved since it started, which I think, yeah, was about 12 years ago. We started off doing just 50 farms a year and I got involved actually through a, a farmer friend at Dairy NZ. The key of it was I think he wanted farmers actually going out to farms um, so that, you know, because obviously we do see a snapshot of the day on the farm and that's not always what it's all about. So it was a really important to get an understanding of the farm. My background is in agricultural business studies, um, but obviously a lifetime of farming. So that does help. So I coordinate the project with Penny. So basically I manage overseeing it, I guess. So we kind of start the project in about November time. We certainly don't want to be out on farm when farmers are busy and we finish up middle of May. We've got a team of 12, that includes myself, that go out onto farms. Yeah, and I oversee those guys, making sure that we're all on the same page, answering any questions they may have. But I also go out on farm doing the farm visits as well, because that's the part of it I really enjoy. 
You must have spoken to a lot of farmers over the years. Tell us more about this process and the sort of feedback that you get in those interactions. Yeah, well, everyone's different. But yes, have spoken to a lot of farmers over the years. I probably do about 40 to 50 visits a year. Various feedback. Some farmers are there and they're writing down different bits and pieces that you're saying so that they can either talk to their team about it or maybe they can introduce that different way of doing something to guys that really, I guess, just go through the motions and are just there to give you the information. But it's really cool when you get someone that's um, really enthusiastic about that animal care space. And as always, you know, we're always learning the whole time. So even guys that are doing it well are learning different things the whole time. The farmers that participate in the consult, what do they get out of it? That is actually one of the things that I'm always very aware of with my team. All of us have got some kind of farming background. Most of us are actually currently dairy farming. Some are partially retired dairy farmers. But yeah, it is always one thing that I say, you know, the farmer's got to get something out of this as well. So I would like to think that at the end, they can ask any questions they want around the animal care space. They learn just by talking themselves about what they're doing. But also because we see so many farms, like Penny said, it's been going for over 12 years now, actually, that we get to see a lot of farms, the team. So we can pass on just a few hints and tips and maybe different ways of doing things, which I think the farmers find really beneficial. And like anything, they get out what they put in. So if they want to ask questions and they're keen to find maybe slightly different ways of doing things, then they'll get the most out of it. Penny, you said the animal care consults have been happening for over a decade. How has the survey changed over the years and what does it look like for the 2023-24 season? So I guess the questions themselves have changed based on sort of what's topical or kind of new research coming into the sector. So Emma Cuttance did a big study around uh, the use of a BRICS to test your colostrum quality in 2017. We found that maybe some farmers weren't quite achieving that, so we've started asking about the use of a BRICS, uh, and then Hannah and the team can kind of talk to the farmers who are interested about how they can go about it. So we've kind of, the questions follow um, sort of research and extension. We're not there to do kind of audits and compliance. It's all anonymous. So Hannah and her team obviously know who they're talking to, but by the time the data gets to Dairy NZ, um, there's no link to the farmer itself. It's all completely anonymous so that we can protect the confidentiality and also we don't follow up and go back on anything. Some questions we've started to build into the consult uh, around positive welfare, so shifting from the kind of more basics of food and water and shelter and looking at opportunities for cows to have a good life. So things like time budgets, you know, how much time does the cow spend at work versus out in the paddock at leisure and thinking about things like grooming brushes, which is really cool to kind of take that conversation with farmers as well. Um, we know sort of consumer and overseas market expectations are, are shifting into more that positive welfare state and our outdoor farm systems allow for a lot of that really cool natural behaviour that cows can engage in. We often hear from farmers that they are doing a lot more reporting these days and this consult asks them a lot of questions. How is that influencing how we do the consult now? Yep, so some of it is overlapping with the dairy processes as our consults sort of continue. They've um, increased reporting requirements. So like there's various, you know, lead with pride and the cooperative difference programs. So they are already reporting some of that stuff to their dairy processor at that sector level. And we work with, you know, Fonterra and Sinlay and the like to kind of get that sense of how animal welfare in the sector is going. And I think that it's actually really useful as well that farmers then have that information already kind of to hand in their insights report or dairy diary. So ahead of the ahead of the conversation, Hannah and her team can kind of prompt farmers to have some of that ready so it's a lot easier to get through. Yeah, I mean, obviously, a lot of people say before we arrive, you know, when we're making the appointment, oh, is there any homework I can do? And yeah, it's basically like Penny said, the dairy company information is helpful and probably the vet health records as well is really helpful for us to get just so that they've got the information in front of them. I like to think, like Penny said, we're not compliant. So it's more than just giving us the information. It's trying to understand that information and see if, you know, there's any way that we can give them a bit of guidance as to how they could improve a few of those things if they've got issues. 
Penny, what are the most recent findings and what do they mean for farmers? So as Hannah has mentioned, the consults, actual on-farm portion of the consults run November to May. So obviously we don't quite have the data for the 23-24 season yet, but we have looked at the 22-23 season data and there's some cool stuff in there about, there's a lot around calf care. That's probably my passion, which is why the the data for calf care sticks in my mind a little bit better, Um, but some really cool stuff around increased levels of anti-inflammatories for disbudding, bricks testing, actually blood testing for failure of passive transfer. So kind of is the colostrum management working, checking that, and then, you know, you can review your systems. There's some good stuff in there around preparing cows for transport. So over 90% of farmers are asking where they're going in their, you know, present at loading. They're there at the the loading ramp to work with the transporter and, and make sure it'll go smoothly. There's increase in mineral supplementation prior to transport as well. We're seeing a a bigger increase in providing magnesium rather than calcium, though. So just to kind of pick up on that, our messaging around preparing cows for transport this season has honed in on that calcium aspect to prevent any metabolic challenges during the transport process. So we can kind of be quite reactive once we've got the survey data, we can feed that in quite quickly to our messaging as well as kind of see like, oh, well, farmers are really good at this thing, so we don't need to bother them with that. They already get a lot of messages, not just from Dairy Z, but lots of other ag businesses. So if they're already really good at this. We don't need to sort of go on about it. We'll focus on things that will make more of a difference for the animals and the farmers. And Penny, we've recently been looking at all of the data collected um, since the consult started. What are some of the trends that stood out in that? Yep, so Stacey Hendricks in our science team is like a statistical whiz and she's pulled the last eight years of data. So it's not the last 12 years because some of the questions didn't quite line up. Um, but over the last eight years, so I think it's the 2016 to the 2022 data, she's looked at that and picked out those trends, like you said, just off the top of my head, you know, bricks use has gone from 6% of farms in 2017 when Emma's research was really new up to it's about 36% at the end of the 23 season and possibly higher again this season once we crunch the numbers. So that one's quite cool to see. You know, there's new research, a new tool available, and a lot of farmers have gone out there, bought a bricks, and are using it to get their calves off to a really good start to life. The blood testing for failure of passive transfer, which I guess goes hand in hand with using a BRICS. Um, That's, I think, increased sevenfold since we started asking that question in 2019. So that's really cool to see. With transport and uh, asking where cows are going and being present at loading, that went from, I think, 75% to over 90. So we can see it was already high, but more farmers um, are still doing it. Um, And then the other kind of aspects of preparing cows for transport, so having water available up until loading and providing like roughage like hay or baleage and calcium, we can see there's still some room for improvement in there, which has informed our messaging and also we'll work with the vets to make sure that they've got that messaging as well. So it's kind of across that chain of people who help with animal care on the farm. I was in the animal care team when the regulations for disbudding came in. Can you tell us about how management of the spudding of calves has changed over that time? Because I'm sure that's pretty clear in the data. Yep, sure. So that regulation came in in October 2019. And at that point, about three quarters of farmers were already using local anaesthetic. And that's now all farmers are using some form of pain relief by the 2022 data. But what we're also seeing is a real increase in the use of um, the sort of the gold standard approach to disbudding, which is getting your vex in to do sedation, local anaesthetic and anti-inflammatory as well for that um, pain relief over the next sort of one to two days. And we're seeing that's sitting over 30% of farmers are using that sort of gold standard approach to pain relief. So it's cool to see. You know, the sector was already really high levels of pain relief before it became a requirement. Um, Now everyone's using pain relief and more and more farmers are pushing to that best practice. So it's quite cool to see the changes in that as well. Hannah, you will have seen changes like these come through. How have your own practices on farm changed in this time? Quite a bit, really. It's more the fine tuning of things. Obviously, seeing lots of farmers every year, you pick up ideas of what people are doing. And so, yeah, we've talked um, in the podcast around 
brushes for cows. So if anyone comes to our farm, yet we've got brushes on the exit race that are basically just attached to the rails and pretty much every cow uses them. We've got a sheep trough um, now at the exit race as well for water so that those generally the the first cows through don't tend to use it too much, but definitely those last 50, 70 cows in the yard, the younger cows possibly, or the less aggressive cows, they'll all have a drink out of it, which is great to see because then they get into the paddock in the summertime and all the old girls around the trough. So at least they've had a drink on the way out. The bricks as well. I can remember bringing the bricks back home and Craig saying, when have we got time to use that? In the colostrum herd, it's a busy time of year. And I said, well, I, I just think we need to find a, make a plan. And I was a bit clumsy in the shed with it. And he was like, right, move aside. I'll make a plan. So, and I often tell this to farmers and they go, oh yeah, because it's, it's really, Often farmers, it, for them, it's how they're going to use it in practice. And that's the big thing. You know, it's got to be practical. So how we use it is we basically have it on a lanyard. Generally, we've got two people in the cow shed. One person will go around. They'll strip the cow first, then put a few squirts from each teat onto the, the glass front. And then they'll have a look. And obviously, if it's good to collect 22, then they'll basically take the milk line off And then the person coming behind them knows, okay, that one goes onto a test bucket. Well, basically, and then the next cow, she may be 15, for example, on the bricks. And for us, yeah, that's not the best colostrum we've got on the day. So that cow will just be cut normally and we'll go into the mixed colostrum for day two, three and four calves. So yeah, it's finding a way to do things. And that's the key to making it work on farm. And you mentioned how different wintering is up here in the, well, most of the North Island compared to the South Island. Do you winter off farm, Hannah, on crop? Yep, we do. We're really fortunate that our winter grazing is right next to the farm. So there's pretty much a, a hole in the hedge. <laughs> so that's fantastic because there's there's no transport and it means, you know, we can check the cows oh, multiple times a day. But yes, no, we, we do graze off farm in the winter. Can you tell me a little bit about um, how your winter grazing management might have changed over the last few years? Yep. No, so it has. I think there's a big focus now on farmers having that plan B and plan C and sometimes plan D. (laughs) Um, So if the weather turns to custard, you know, having a paddock that you can possibly put your cows in, that's been a, a big factor for us. And we've been really fortunate that our grazier has, has often got that for us because if you don't own the land, it's often out of your control. So we've definitely improved plan B. I think probably the use of wearables has been a big factor in our winter grazing. So we do graze fodder beet, which everyone knows is a pretty hot crop and you've got to get it right. And the use of wearables has definitely helped us to monitor the rumination of the cows. And even though we feed fodder beet on the crop, we start transitioning in the autumn, we're feeding it now, we'll get up to three, four kgs milking, and then we'll feed it at the winter grazing block. And yeah, it just shows that when you monitor their rumination, they, they need a good two weeks, possibly a little bit more to really fully transition onto it. So that's been a really good animal health tool for us, the cow manager tags that we use. So Callum Eastwood and Brian Delarue and our research team at DRNZ, they have actually been tracking the use of technology on farms um, for quite a while. So they do, they check in sort of every five years and just probably reflects Hannah's actual experience on farm. There's been a big increase in those cow wearables in the last three years. It's gone from 3% to 16%. So like collars, ear tags, boluses, and I think it's around 30% in Canterbury. So Hannah's right in the area where there's been a lot of that um, cow wearable adoption. And we've actually included a question in our survey for this current season. So I don't have any of the information yet because we haven't quite closed it off. Um, but Hannah and the team have been asking farmers how they're using their collars for transition cow management. So not around the heat detection, which is a lot of the reason farmers are investing in them, but actually what have they changed in their um, springer cow space? I don't know, Hannah, if you've got any kind of early anecdotal before we've got the whole data set together. I've done a handful in the Waikato just last week and um, obviously mainly in Canterbury. 
mainly the things that farmers are, are following is, is rumination, obviously. So how the cows are ruminating and mainly around the transition time, they're using it. And I'm finding a lot more guys are actually keeping their colostrum cows in that colostrum herd for some of them, look, some of them 10, 12, 14 days. And they're finding that that's really helping their rumination to be in that herd before they then go into the the milking herd. Um, So keeping them on once a day for a lot longer than the standard always used to be. Now, Penny, you just mentioned questions changing. um, And sometimes that's because of what we see on the horizon. Um, So what is on the horizon for farming in New Zealand? So animal welfare is obviously really important to farmers, but also to our overseas markets where we're trying to sell our dairy products at a premium. And increasingly, you know, the Nestle's and Danone's, those big customers are asking our dairy processors more and more about animal care practices on farm to show that, you know, we are giving our animals a good life. Our pastoral farming systems provide a lot of that but we don't really have any information around it. So we've been asking more, you know, the food, water, vet care, animal health for quite a while. And now we're starting to include in some of the sort of conversations time budget. So how much time does a cow spend milking and walking, so working, and how much time does she spend doing cow things like grooming uh, and ruminating and having those social interactions in her herd. So pushing into that positive welfare space, we're asking a bit more around managing some of the risks of heat and cold or hot and cold weather, and farmers do have those management strategies for hot weather, so sprinklers and fans and things, and looking at sort of future solutions as well. So sometimes the questions inform our research at Dairy NZ as well. So farmers are using those things like sprinklers and fans and shelter in the paddocks, but we don't really understand how that stacks together. Like is a sprinkler and a fan and a trough at the watershed equivalent to a tree and a trough in the paddock? How does that mitigate the cow and reduce her heat load? So we've kind of used some of the data that we've collected on what farmers are doing and what practices they can currently implement um, to inform some of the research that Dairy NZ are doing with Ag Research and Fonterra to like really accurately measure heat load and the impact of, you know, the sun and the wind to identify those at risk regions and look at how we can make those mitigations work better for farmers and cows. So it loops in, we track how research is adopted through the survey, but sometimes the results from the survey inform our research as well. So it's quite cool in that loop. Thank you so much for talking with us today, Penny and Hannah. Penny, thank you for telling us more about the animal care consults and how that information helps Dairy NZ work smarter for farmers. And Hannah, we really appreciate you taking time away from the farm to talk to us about your involvement and also how your own animal care practices have changed over time. Mati wa noho ora mai. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Talking Dairy. Check the show notes on where to go for more information on this topic. And if you have any ideas on future episodes, please send an email to talkingdairy at dairynz.co.nz.